OK, so uh, for those of you that uh, are familiar faces, welcome back. I hope you had a great summer. For those of you that I haven't had before, welcome back. I hope you had a great summer. Uh, you're here for Digital Tools for Architects, which is Archie 135 this semester, or 136. God, I'm, clearly, I'm still on summer break, too. Um, which is Rhino and V-Ray, uh, which is kind of the advanced modeling class uh, for those of you that are, that are becoming architects etc. So hopefully you're in the right room. If you're not, <laughs> that would be the time to leave. Um, and for those people that aren't here yet, hopefully they'll find us at some point. My name is Grant Adams. Uh, for those of you that don't already know me, I'm an associate professor of architecture here at DVC. I actually have a slide that I'll do next that'll give you a little bit more background about me. thought it was important to put that in. haven't done that in the past. Uh, but a couple things. If you want to get a hold of me, I have two email addresses. You can send an email to either one. My school email is gadams at dvc.edu. And um, my digital tools email address is grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. Depends on how much typing you want to do when you put that one in. Uh, they both end up coming to the same place. So chances are, if you email me at the school email, I'll reply from the Digital Tools for Architects. Um, so anyway, it's there. You're more than welcome to email me at any point. Uh, my phone number is listed here as well. So if you need to get a hold of me, by all means, you can text me. That's fine. Uh, let me know that you're not going to be here or you're going to be late or one of those kinds of uh, things. If you text me at 3 in the morning, chances are I will not respond to you. So I reserve the right not to answer <laughs> or not to respond to you. Uh, but it's there, and I try to be responsive if I can. Uh, my office hours, I have two times because of the way that my classes are set up. I teach the uh, 135 class right before this one. Um, so I have office hours before that class on Monday, so 6.55 to 7.55. A few of you get here that early uh, or have in the past gotten here that early. Um, the other option is right after this class from 2.15 to 3.15, I'm available for you on Wednesdays. So I do the morning on Monday and I do the afternoon on Wednesday. I'm around a lot anyway, and you can ask me questions whenever I'm around. That's, that's perfectly OK. So those are my official office hours. I will either be in this room or I'll be in my office, which is 104B, which is right across the, the hallway there. Um, and you guys can come talk to me there as well. So a little bit of background about me, just so you know who I am. Um, I have two degrees from Berkeley. The first one is a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture, so in the lingo. It's a B Arts in Arch. Um, I graduated in 2004. That's a four year, I'm telling you guys this in the more advanced class because I'm thinking you're probably thinking about this sort of thing right now. That is a four year unaccredited architecture degree. So that translates to you can't go practice, become a practicing architect with that degree. You need a master's program on top of it. So I did my master of architecture, my MARC uh, at UC Berkeley in 2007. Um, that's a two-year degree. So for me, I did a four plus two, which is one of the plans that you can go through as you become uh, an architect. Um, if you went to Cal Poly, on the other hand, you would get a Bachelor of Architecture degree, so different than a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture. You would get a Bachelor of Architecture degree, and that is a professional degree, so you could practice. That's a five-year degree. Now, if you wanted to add, this is not relevant for most of you, but if you wanted to add a master's degree on top of a Cal Poly degree, you can go for your master's for one year. So they all end up being the same amount of time. So if that made no sense to you, don't worry about it. You'll get to that point later on uh, in your career. So um, that's my schooling background. I work here two days a week. I'm here on Mondays and on Wednesdays. And the rest of the time, I'm off doing projects and, and whatever other stuff. So uh, I'm a property manager designer, general contractor. I have a Class B license. I'm building a project, five units in Lafayette right now. Those of you that have, that have been in my classes before know I refer to those because it's kind of this never-ending project, though it should be done really soon. I'm hoping sometime during this semester I'll be, I'll be wrapped up with it, which is good. Um, so that's what I do on the rest of the days of the week. That's my, quote, real job, so to speak. There's a website for this class. It's digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. For those of you that have been in 135 before, and the reason that I refer to that is because there's a fair number of you, not quite as many as last semester. Last semester, I think everybody in the class, minus maybe one or two people, had been in 135 with me. Um, this semester, not quite so many. Uh, but we'll, I will do a few contrasts to that for those of you 
uh, that took 135, just so you know, by the way, you don't have to take them in order. So if you haven't taken 135, don't worry about it. You can take 135 later uh, or take it with someone else or whatever if you don't like me. You're stuck with me in 136, though. You can't take it with anybody else. So, um, But if it can be out of order, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is the website. It's digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. If you have an account with the website from last semester or from a, any previous semester, you can use that account. You don't have to set up a new account. If you haven't ever taken a uh, class with me and you don't have an account, you probably got an email last week, about a week ago, with uh, registration. If you didn't get it, no worries, we'll get you registered today. But I tried to go through and make sure I got everybody uh, who I hadn't seen before. You're going to look at this website to view your exercises and assignments. I will always post them on the course website. Uh, you also, there's important course information, you know, the syllabus is on there, the calendar is on there, you can subscribe to the calendar feed if you want. Um, you will post all of your exercises and all of your assignments when they're due. That's how you're basically going to be turning in your work for this class. There's a bunch of tutorials, videos, lectures, all kinds of stuff that's on there. You can use any and all of that uh, for yourself as well. And you will also comment on other students' work, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. I throw some Rhino pictures in there uh, and some V-Ray stuff. Um, you can view the course calendar on the website. You can subscribe to it if you want. If you need help doing that, I can help you out with that. Our schedule is 11.10 to 12.10, roughly, for lecture. And then 12.10 to 2.15 is our lab period afterwards. Now, if you notice this, 11 to 2, it spans some really important thing that happens right about that time of the day called lunch. A little bit awkward. I apologize for that, but I don't make the schedule. So if you need some food, just step outside. You know, don't like open up your In-N-Out burger on, on the, you know, that, that doesn't work. So go outside and, uh, and eat your food. That's fine. I respect the fact that this is during lunch. So if you need a snack and food and whatever, just go for it. No big deal. Um, please don't do it while I'm lecturing. That would be counterproductive. So wait until I'm done. And then during the lab portion, probably in between the two, take your little bit of a break. The uh, hour for lecture and the two, and a half, two hours and 15 minutes for lab, that's a rough time estimate. It's going to vary depending on what it is that we're doing and how much demo I need to do for that particular thing. Some days there'll be more lab time. Some days there'll be less. So it'll vary based on the content that we have. Uh, the course description, you guys can read this. Basically, it says you're going to learn Rhino and V-Ray. Sounds pretty good to me. Student learning outcomes. These are important. I'm supposed to tell you these on the first day. They're also in your syllabus. Uh, this is how we hold accountability for what it is that I'm trying to teach you and that it matches up with what I said I'm going to teach you. Uh, we're going to create digital models that explore complex geometries uh, and forms in Rhino 3D modeling software. So basically, that means we're going to build a bunch of stuff in Rhino, and those forms are going to end up being complex. We're going to start with really simple forms, but we'll get into the complex stuff. We're going to create digital models that explore non-orthogonal shapes, point clouds, and nerves. Yes, absolutely, we will do that. That's part of the same kind of complex objects thing. We're going to translate three-dimensional digital models into two-dimensional patterns and drawings for fabrication. So we will build something complicated in 3D. We'll slice it up, and we'll take it to the laser cutter and cut it out and glue it together. That'll be one of your assignments. A lot of you have seen that before. We'll construct architectural elements and forms using CAD CAM manufacturing techniques for laser fabrication. Uh, this kind of falls under the same boat. I should also point in there that I'm trying really hard to integrate 3D printing into the class. So we'll try to do some 3D printing. Um, some of this is on your own time. Some of it is on my time. So I will make sure that you can get a valid G code file out and be able to 3D print. In terms of me sitting over there and supervising you 3D printing, probably not going to happen. Uh, hopefully, there'll be lab techs that'll help that process happen. Uh, but these are some examples of previous little skyscraper models that people have built uh, over time. So uh, they'll be up here if you guys want to see them. But we'll do something along those lines. And then we're going to do a bunch of rendering using materials, lighting, um, camera settings, etc., all in V-Ray. So I should also mention, and I think it's right here, there we go, that finally, it's only been years and years and years of me complaining, we got upgraded over the uh, spring or summer break. So that's good. Not the computers, but the software. So we are going to, previously I'd been in Rhino 5. We're now going to be in Rhino 6, which is great. There's some new, new features in Rhino 6 that are huge. 
And we're also going, we jumped majorly in V-Ray. We were in V-Ray 1.5. We're now in V-Ray 3.6. So we've gone several versions ahead. And I will tell you right now that that's going to complicate things today. Uh, and it's going to complicate things all semester. Um, it is kind of the way it's going to be. And I apologize for that in advance. When the Chaos Group, the company that makes V-Ray, when they changed from the old V-Ray, the 1.5, into the new V-Ray, which uh, started out in 2.0 and then made it to 3.0 and then uh, now up to 3.6, they changed a lot of stuff to try to make it more clear. That also means they moved everything around. And it also means that all the tutorials that I've written got changed. And the graphics look different and whatever. It's all still there. The content's the same, but the organization has changed. So it's going to be some, oh, it's over here. And I, I thought it was over here. Wait, hold on. It's right there. Uh, so there's going to be a little of that. And it just is the way it is. And so I apologize. You're the first class that I'll teach it with. So there'll be some adjustments that we'll need to make. Uh, that being said, normally I have a required textbook for the class, which gives you all the tutorials. If you have it from last semester, great. You can still use it as a reference point. But the V-Ray section is completely outdated because we just updated. So uh, you guys get off the hook and don't need to buy it. Um, if you want it for all the rest of the Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, Collage, Rhino stuff, that's fine. But just know that the V-Ray is out of date. So I'm full disclosure, it is what it is. I'll update it, and then it'll be ready. I can't promise when it will be updated, though. So uh, I'll let you know once I get to that point. So the grading, the all-important grading question, because everybody wants to know how they're going to be graded. There is no midterm. There is no final for the class. It's all project-based. The grades are based on your lab exercises, which are 20%, your assignments, which are 40%, your final project, which is 30%, and your participation, which is 10%. If you guys took 135 with me, you recognize this looks very, very familiar. Okay? Um, it's designed to be a pretty even workload. So most of the work that you're going to be doing can be done in class. It's a great companion class to uh, 121 or 220, uh, if, those, if any of you guys are in those classes. So you don't have the big spikes. You don't have the, oh, I got all this work to do, and then I'm going to sleep for a while. And then I got all this work to do, and then I'll sleep again. Um, notice that the sleeping doesn't happen during the work part. Right? That's the way architecture school works. So um, this, pro this class shouldn't be like that. It should be you come, you get your work done, you do a lot of work in class, that's great, we move on. Some of the work has to be done outside of class. Um, when we do work outside of class, you can get a student version of Rhino. Uh, I believe there is also a trial, and I have to double check this, and I think the trial is 90 days. And so you can use the full version for 90 days. Don't sign up for it today. Wait until it's 90 days before the end of the semester and then sign up for it. You don't need it yet. You can work on the lab computers. Otherwise, of course, you can work on the lab computers without a problem, uh, and it's all included there. Don't even bother trying to figure out how to install V-Ray on your home computer. Not worth it. Uh, we will use the V-Ray Swarm in here, which is distributed rendering. We'll use all the computers to, to render with us. So it's going to make a big difference having it in here versus having it uh, at home regardless. So just don't worry about that. The licensing is always really challenging uh, with the Chaos Group anyway. So I'll talk about all of those in a little bit more depth. The lab exercises are what you're going to do in the lab portion of the class. So that's that 11.15 to, or 12.15 uh, to 2.15 or whatever it is. They're worth 20% of your overall grade. It's all about learning skills. It's all about learning how to do something. I'm gonna, you know, we'll have a day where we model pillows and you'll be learning how, to, how do I make that kind of a complex shape and how do I make it look realistic and we'll talk through that and you'll practice with it. That doesn't mean that they have to turn out perfect. It means you're learning. So it's graded on a pass, not pass basis. So if you do it and you turn it in, you'll get the credit for it. If you don't do it, you don't turn it in, you don't get the credit for it. So you should feel free to experiment and, and try things out and see if they work, see if they don't work. That's the whole point of trying to do it. Um, so there's no, there's no uh, oh, partial credit or whatever. It's either you do it, you get credit. You don't do it, you don't get credit. Pretty clear. They should be due at the end of the lab period. So if you didn't quite finish something or didn't quite turn out the way you want, it's OK. Still post it. That's what you did for this particular day in lab. And you'll get credit for it. The assignments, on the other hand, tend to be a little bit larger, tend to require work outside of class. 
And outside of class might mean that you finished your lab exercise a little bit early and you spent some time working on it. It might mean that you have to come in here during a different time and do a little bit of work on it. The assignments are collectively worth 40% of your overall grade. There's usually about four assignments in this class, so fewer than the 135 class, which means they're all about 10% of your overall grade. Um, our first assignment doesn't come for quite a while. It's out there a ways because you guys need to learn some skills to begin with. I have no expectation that you've ever even opened Rhino. If you have, that's great. But if you haven't, that's totally OK. We will build a bunch of skills. I'm not going to throw you in and give you some complicated assignment right away. We'll spell, spend some time. That's part of why there aren't as many assignments. It's important to note that the assignments are graded not only on the skills that you have, have executed when you do it, but also how well you did. So if we talk about uh, the first project is usually a table and a chair. And if we look at that table and chair project, there are things like, how did you make the geometry? Did it turn out well? Those kinds of questions. There's also things like, did you apply textures correctly? Did it render correctly? Is the scale of the textures appropriate? So there's a lot of things that go into it. That is also coupled with the overall design of the chair. Is it an interesting chair? Does it look good? Is it rendered well? Is the composition of the image good? Those kinds of things as well. So it's your overall product. It's not just, hey, I checked the boxes. I have a texture. I have a, uh, you know, a box, and I, I'm good to go. So there's a little bit more to it. Just like with the 135, if you were in that, you can submit regrades on any of the, these assignments, which basically means you do that first table and chair. You get a grade back, and you say, ooh, I didn't really like that grade. That wasn't very good. You can do it again and you can turn it in. When you do it again, when you submit a regrade, it's as if the first one didn't happen. Like you never turned it in. I never even saw it. Which means that your grade can go up or it can go down. Chances are the grade's going to go up. But it's fair, because that way you have a fresh start, and I grade it fresh, as if it's the first one never even happened. So that's how a regrade works. The other thing about a regrade is I won't do the regrades until the very end of the semester. So you'll get the grade that you get. It'll stay that way until the end of the semester. And after I do all the grading, I'll go back and do the regrades. The reason that I do this is it saves me a little bit of work. If you already have an A, it doesn't make any difference whether I go back and regrade you. Because you already have an A, you can't get a higher A. It's just an A. So uh, if you get a lower grade, let's say you got a B, that's when those regrades start to play in. You do a regrade, and it might bump you up as you get a little bit closer. So I won't do that until the very end of class. All right, course participation. So after most of the exercises, and I say most here, not all, and all of the assignments, you're going to be required to give some constructive feedback to your fellow classmates. And you're going to do this using the course website, using the comment section. The reason that I say most exercises is that there are some things that we will do in this class where I'm modeling a specific object, and we're all going to make the same thing, and it makes no difference for you to make constructive criticism about all of us making the same object. Because you're just trying to learn some basic skills. What are you going to say about the same thing? Everybody's is the same. Uh, so there will be ones that just basically don't count. So in the 135, I think uh, it averages maybe 75 comments. In this class, it averages more like 45. So there's going to be fewer comments. Um, don't get behind on the comments. We'll talk about this once it kind of starts happening to try to stay current, because it's a lot harder to catch up than to stay current. Um, this is part of your participation grade. It's actually 5% of your overall grade, or half of your participation grade from the class. Uh, and I'll, I'll hold your hand in the very beginning when we start to do this. It doesn't matter for right now, because we won't do comments for a, little bit while, for a little while in the class anyway. Materials. So how many people have taken a class in one of the computer labs here before? All right, Most of you. If you haven't taken a class, it's really important that you know one critical thing. And that is, if you save something on the computer and the computer shuts down and restarts for any reason, it's gone. The computers are all frozen. They don't save anything on them. So you can't rely on that. So you guys need to bring a flash drive or a little hard drive. Um, frequently, people are moving more into the little hard drive category rather than a flash drive. You need to bring one of those to class every day with you. I have had people who try to do like Google Drive, and they download a folder, and then they upload a folder. It's not the best idea in this class especially, because you have these big material libraries. You have a lot of stuff that you're going to end up needing, and it gets complicated. 
it's better if you have your own flash drive. Uh, you can use the OneDrive system on the school computers to back up to OneDrive from your flash drive. So you can have your flash drive, you can do OneDrive. And if you're interested in doing that or you don't remember how from 135, I'm happy to help you through that. That being said, make sure you safeguard your flash drive or your hard drive. All the horror stories have actually happened. Those of you in 135, you know I spend a whole day talking about all the horror stories and trying to convince you that it's a good idea to back up your stuff. Uh, the flash drive height is perfect for your knee to break it off when you spin your chair on these computers. It's a great design flaw of these, these computers and tables. Uh, so don't snap it off. Don't put it in your pocket and then take your jeans off and go home and put them in the wash. Bad idea. Uh, you know, don't leave it behind. If you leave it behind, it'll probably be floating around somewhere up here or somewhere over here. If I see it, I'll put it there. Uh, the good news is they're not valuable enough for anybody to steal anymore. It used to be where they were really valuable. Now, nobody cares. Um, so just don't lose it. Keep track of your stuff. Back up your stuff. That's a good idea. Uh, OneDrive is a pretty good system for doing that. So just be aware of all those kinds of things. If you come to me halfway through the semester and you say, I lost my flash, flash drive, I'm going to say, bummer. Hope you have a backup. Right? Because I'm telling you that right now. So make sure you have your backups. Um, you'll also need some physical modeling stuff. I told you we were going to do some physical modeling. You'll need to buy a couple sheets of cardboard over the course of the semester, some glue, maybe a few X-Acto blades, that kind of thing. Not big expenditure, but just so that you're aware. Uh, that's out there too. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of cost for this class, which is a good thing. Uh, when it comes to 3D printing, as far as I know, unless they've changed anything, uh, this is all on us, so you don't have to worry about paying for it, which is kind of nice. Um, so that's, that's a nice little bonus. Uh, I think I covered all that stuff. Oh, I should mention, 32 gigs or larger for the flash drive. 32 would be like the bare minimum squeaking by if you had no other classwork that you were saving on it. Get something a little bit larger, it's just, just nice. Uh, the, the portable hard drives are really the right way to go for a class like this. Because you're going to have material libraries, you're going to have a bunch of stuff that you'll end up storing on it. Rhino files can get really large sometimes. Uh, you're working on a big file, suddenly it's a one gig file. So just be aware that that can happen. Um, give yourself that extra space. Attendance in this class is mandatory. I expect you to be here every day. I expect myself to be here every day. That's a good thing. You need to be in your assigned seats. Like I said, we're going to pick those seats next class. So where you sit will be your, your, uh, your seat for the rest of the semester. With your computer turned on, logged in, etc by about 11.15 or so. I usually try to give a little bit, class starts officially at 11.10, try to give a little bit of flex time for you guys to get logged in and all that sort of thing. Uh, and then we'll be good to go at about 11.15 or so. You can't leave class early either. I'll tell you right now, especially if you're in 220 or you're in 121, you have work to do. You actually have work to do right now, even though you haven't taken the class yet. You should be doing something. It's just that's the way those classes work. You should always be doing something. So if you finish one of my uh, lab exercises early, open that up and start working on that. Open up your 220 project, start working on that. There is always stuff to do. I promise you that. So uh, use your time wisely. Stay in class. The way that I do this is when I take role, I pick role sometime in the middle of class. Well, I should say sometime during the class. Could be at the beginning, could be at the middle, could be at the very end. And I go through and I take roll, and that'll count for the day. If you happen to be outside eating lunch, chances are I'll see you. The other thing is, I'll know most of you anyway, pretty quickly, I know most of you already. Uh, and I'll see you walk back in and then I'll check you off. Or I know that you're here, because I keep a pretty good idea, idea of who's here and who's not. But I take it at a random time because it audits you, it holds you accountable, it makes sure that you're here for the whole time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so it's worth half of your overall participation grade. So five, uh, it's worth half of your participation grade, which is 10%, which means your overall grade is worth 5%. Um, so just be here. That allows you to ask questions. It also allows you to say, wait a minute, I didn't understand what you did during the demo. Can you go back and, and go through that again, uh, which is really important on this. Additional course guidelines. If you're going to miss two weeks or more of class, that's really problematic. You've got to be here to learn this stuff. So you may be withdrawn from the class. You also probably wouldn't do very well. Um, if you get too far behind, it's not going to be good. If you're going to be late or if you're going to miss class, I ask that you please email or text me ahead of time. I don't think this is too much to ask. 
my analogy is always if you're working at a job, let's say you work at Starbucks, and you just didn't show up for work one day and you didn't tell anybody, what would happen? Well, you'd get fired. Not a good thing. So treat school the same way. You know you're sick, send an email, send a text message. It's not that hard. Mr. Adams, I'm really sick. Send. OK, I got it. I got the message. So send me an email ahead of time. Let me know. It helps me know not to wait for other people to show up or, or whatever. It's, especially in this class when I do a lot of demos, it's really hard to have people walk in while you're in the middle of the demo. And then the people that walk in are completely lost because they missed the first you know, 10 minutes of me explaining how to get to where they are. And then the whole thing's useless. So make sure you're here on time. Uh, make sure you let me know, et cetera. Uh, assignment due dates will be announced in class. So I'll give you plenty of warning. These assignments tend to be pretty long. So I'll give you the assignment several weeks before it's actually due. There'll be a lot of time to work on it, et cetera. Um, if you haven't completed more than three assignments in the class, well, three out of four assignments not being completed, you can kind of do the math yourself. That wouldn't be very good. So make sure you do the work uh, and turn it in on time. Exercises are due at 2.15 on the day they're assigned. So you'll have an exercise today. It's due by the end of class today. In this class, occasionally, you just need a little extra time. You got bogged down on something. I'm not going to be super strict about this end time. I just want you to turn it in. The reason that I put an end time on it is because I don't want you struggling and spending a bunch of time outside of class. It's designed to be in the lab. You finish it in the lab. You post it. If you need a little extra time, not the end of the world. But don't spend lots and lots of extra time. It's not designed for that. Additional course guidelines. So there's 27 of you, hopefully. I don't know. There's supposed to be 27 of you. Uh, and there's one of me. So it takes me time to get through everybody. You know, you have a question, you raise your hand, I come around, I try to help you. It takes time. Don't just sit there and do the like, oh, I'm not going to do anything while I wait for you. Right? Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, do you know how to do this? Do you understand how I did that? Wait, how did he do that? Because chances are your neighbor might know. And that gets you unstuck and lets you keep working. So it's important for you guys to try to do that. You are each other's resource beyond just me. That being said, doesn't mean I don't want to come around and help you. I'll do my best to get to everybody. But it takes time to work my way through and back. So just be aware of that. Um, you're not going to be bringing the handbook to class because you're not going to buy it in the first place. Uh, and all the work is done under a Creative Commons license. If you have issues with that, we can talk about that at a later time. Late work policy. So. If you turn something in late, it's graded down by one letter grade per class that it's late. So if we had something due this morning and you didn't turn it in before I start talking, it would be due before next class. So that would mean it would be due on Wednesday before I start talking. The reason that it's due before I start talking is I don't want you trying to deal with it while I'm talking. So it's done before. Graded down one letter grade, so 10% per class that it's late. If you're more than four classes late and you still do it, I'll give you a max credit of 50%. So you, it's still better to do it than to not do it. And I'll give you that. Uh, best thing is just not be late. Uh, if you didn't turn it in at all, no surprise, you get a zero. OK, so let me ask you a quick question. This is secret, right? Is it better to turn something in and do a regrade when it's on time? Or is it better to be late? turn something in on time and do a regrade because you didn't lose the 10%. If you turn it in late, the late penalty sticks. So even if you do a regrade, it's still late, and you still uh, lose that 10% or 20% or whatever it is. So do yourself a favor and turn it in on time. The reason that I'm a really strong stickler about on time is because in real life, you can't be late. If you have something that's due, you have something due before a meeting, whatever, you you can't be late. It has to be done and it has to be turned in. Even if it's not as good as you want it to be, you still have to meet that deadline. So in this class, you still have to meet that deadline as well. So these are just some examples. And then we'll get into some student work. A lot of this is rendering. Some of it's outdated because it's a little bit older. And I apologize for that. Some of this has some Photoshop work done to it. But we're going to learn a lot.
lot about rendering, lighting, et cetera. Everybody always wants to do, these are too dark, and I apologize, the glare on the screen doesn't make it as good as they are in real life. But everybody always wants to do the night renderings and the really sexy ones. We will do that in this class. We'll talk through what a night rendering means. How do you artificially light a scene? Where do you place the lights? All that kind of stuff. Uh, because it can make a big difference. Always, always better on screen than off. So I'm just going to flip through the, the rest of these guys. OK, so I'm going to stop. We will, let's see, what is it? It's 11.50. Let's come back at mm, 12.05. Gives you a little bit of time. And w then we will sit down and we will do exercise 201. Exercise 201, we will actually open Rhino. We will build something for the first time. You'll, you'll create something. And then we'll post it on the course website. And I'll walk you all the way through that. So it does take a little bit of time for me to go through all that. So take your little break now. Then we'll go through it. You guys can do it with me live, uh, and we'll go from there. Any questions? No, I'll see you at 12.05. OK, so we're going to get uh, started up. And um, we're going to do exercise 201. You should have gotten the handout for that. Uh, it's also available on the course website. I'll show you where that is in a little bit. But we're actually today going to jump right into Rhino and, and get started with some modeling. Now, the entertaining thing about today is the shape that we're going to build will probably take maybe about an hour uh, to make. At the end of the semester, if I asked you to make this shape, probably would take less than 30 seconds. So you're going to get a lot better at Rhino. That's the truth. Um, it's a big kind of program. There's a lot of stuff going on in it. It'll take a little bit of time and practice to get used to how to work with Rhino. For those of you that have worked in AutoCAD before, Rhino is very, very similar to AutoCAD. Actually, it shares many of the similar commands. So it should feel rather natural if you've done work in AutoCAD before. Um, I always liken it to what AutoCAD 3D should be. Um, I, I think AutoCAD in 3D is about as awful as it could possibly get, um, and that Rhino really got it right. And that's part of why it's been so successful, uh, at least in the world of architecture. So um, I'm going to ask that you guys first go to the course website, because I'm going to have you download a little sample file to get started. It has some environmental things that are already installed, which will help for our renderings a little bit later on. Um, so you're going to go to the course website, which is digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. Notice um, this is distinctly not part of the Canvas system on the campus. It's, it's separate and apart from that. Um, I run the course website differently because I think it's more successful and has a lot more opportunity for content than uh, the Canvas system does. So um, it's digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. When you get there, and I will work through getting an account and all that stuff a little bit later on in the class, but when you get there, you're going to go to the Exercises tab. Right here, you'll come down to Digital Tools for Architects or Archie 136. All of your stuff will, will start there. And we're going to go to the fall of 2019, which is this semester. And you'll see that our first exercise is exercise 201. That's the one that we're doing today. Uh, so you can go ahead and click on it. By the way, all of the stuff for 136 for this class start in the 200s. So your exercises are 201, 202. Your assignments will be 201, 202. The lectures, 201, 202. So it's easy to kind of see. So when you look on my YouTube channel, just look for the 200s uh, if you're looking for something specific. So uh, here we are at exercise 201. If we scroll down here a little bit under part two, it says, please download this exercise 201.3dm from the course website. That's what I want you to get. We will come back and work through part one, but it's not worth doing it right now. We're going to jump and, and work in Rhino first. Uh, so this exercise 201.3dm file, I want you to right click on it and say save link as or download link to file, depending on which browser you're using. Uh, and we'll store it today on the desktop. Down the road, you'll want to store it on your flash drive. So we'll go ahead and save that file. And once it's on the desktop, there it is, I'm going to double click on that file, and it will open in Rhino 6.
Yep. Make sure you're looking in the exercises, not under the assignments. So make sure you're in the exercises. There it is. Yeah, no assignments have been in, in, have been given out yet, so there won't be anything under there just yet. Okay. Uh, it looked like there was a little error. I told you this kind of stuff is going to pop up. It said there's an invalid V-Ray material. That's fine. Don't worry about it. This was the file from last semester when we didn't have this version of V-Ray. So before we get started actually building anything, I want to talk through the interface in Rhino just a little bit so that you know what it is that we're looking at. Um, we have our traditional menu structure up here at the top, the file, the edit, etc. Notice that there is also curve, surface, and solid. Those are all three kind of primary key things that we'll be working with. The curves are obviously the most basic in our, in our elements. The surfaces are surfaces that connect those curves together. Uh, and then solids are things like cubes and, and where we actually have some fake mass. Uh, so all of the commands that we use in Rhino are actually available, or I should say not all, but most of them are available in three ways. One way is through the menu structure. So if you wanted to create something, uh, say a line, you could go to curve and then choose line, et cetera. Uh, so those are available here in the menu structure should you want those that way. Directly below this set uh, of our traditional menus is what's called the command line. And in AutoCAD, there is a command line. It tends to float where your cursor is or kind of float down at the bottom of the screen. Rhino's docked up top by default. Um, and this is something that we're going to want to pay a lot of attention to. As we're, as we're working, it will prompt you for next steps. So if we're creating a cube, for example, it'll, it'll prompt, what do you do now? What do you do now? So you want to kind of keep an eye on that. You'll get used to doing that as we work. It is also a way of interacting with commands. So if we wanted to create a line, for example, we could start typing line. Uh, and Rhino actually pulls up a list of all similar things as we start to type. So here I wanted a line. It's there. If I kept typing, L-I-N, there it is, line. Um, and so that's just another way of initiating a line command. And we'll talk through that as we go forward. When I do demos, I will mix around how I access a given command. So I will try to go from the menu structure. I'll try to go from the command line. And I'll also go from one of our buttons here um, on the sides. So below the command line, we have a series of V-Ray tools that have been installed. There's actually a few more V-Ray tools right here. These tabs allow you to jump from different uh, kind of tool sets. It's kind of like the ribbons in AutoCAD. Um, for the most part, I don't interact with them that much, but they are there. The V-Ray rendering one is the one that shows by default. But you can switch tabs, uh, say, to standard or C-planes, et cetera, depending on what it is that you're creating. On the left side here, we have our most commonly used tools. You'll work with those a lot. Uh, it's important to note that on things like here, the surface tool, there's a little kind of uh, triangle in the corner. If you click on the triangle in the corner, there's a bunch of tools hidden underneath the primary tool. Uh, this is something that uh, the Adobe Suite does a lot of, where they hide other tools underneath. So if you're, if you're creating a surface here, you might be interested in the surface from three or four corner points, but you also might be interested in a rectangular plane. Uh, a rectangular plane created with three points, a vertical rectangular plane. So you see that there's lots of options uh, available underneath the one rectangular plane. Same thing with the, um, the box tool, for example. If I click the triangle next to it, we have, besides a box, we have cylinders and spheres and cones and uh, pyramids and, and that sort of thing as well. So it's just important to be aware that those exist underneath our, uh, our tool sets there. As we work our way around the screen down here at the bottom, you should see uh, a series of toggles available to you. I know they're kind of right below my head. It should say end, near, point, mid, cent, int, perp, tan, etc. Those are our object snaps. If you're not seeing those object snaps, there's also a button right here in the middle that says O snap. That should be on. Uh, you might have to turn on the persistent O snap. Now it looks like they fixed that and now it's just on by default. Uh, in Rhino. I would recommend having endpoint turned on, midpoint turned on, and perpendicular turned on by default. Those are the three big ones in my book. The other ones you can turn on when you need them. 
So if you're working with circles or cylinders, you might turn on quad snap, uh, but I don't leave it on by default. Stay away from the intersect snap. That one can be a little bit tricky depending on how your geometry is in 3D. You can get false um, positives. Uh, center snap can be useful, but again, it's, it's specific to what it is that you're modeling. Uh, likewise, near uh, is a really risky one because you're not necessarily snapping to what you think you're snapping to. It's just some point that's on an object. Uh, so I leave that one unchecked. And we will, we will get to what not and vertex mean a little bit later on in the semester. So for right now, end, mid, and perp are selected. At the very bottom here, we have some information like what our units currently are. So it says inches right there. It's kind of right behind me. Do make sure that yours says inches. If it doesn't say inches, that's a problem. We'll need to correct that. Uh, my guess is that if you all open my template file, it should all say inches without a problem. Okay, So it should say inches. It says what our current layer is. That's the default layer. At the bottom here, we have a series of toggles that include ortho uh, and grid snap, etc. As long as OSNAP and smart tracking are on, we're pretty much good to go, which are on by default. On the right side over here, we have basic information about, in this case, it's our viewport, but about our object, etc. Uh, there are a series of tabs underneath, one of which would be our layers tab. We'll work extensively with layers. Uh, we also have a rendering tab that gives us more information about rendering. We have a materials tab that gives us more information about materials. We'll get to those a little bit later on. I'm going to leave it just as the basic properties uh, tab for right now. So I've worked my way all the way around the outside of the screen, but I haven't talked about the uh, Rhino screen itself. So by default, we're seeing um, four separate viewports of our model, one of which is in perspective. That's the 3D viewport. Then we're seeing a top, a front, and a right side. This should look very similar if you took 130 ever. Uh, or at least I hope it looks familiar, where we have a top, a front, and a right side. We can work in any and all of these viewports simultaneously. So we can jump into one of those viewports and suddenly start working in that viewport. The other thing that we have the option of doing is we have the option of making one of the viewports take up all the space. So instead of having a screen split into four, we could double click here where it says perspective, and we do that we see one large viewport that is just perspective. To get out of that, we would double click on perspective. We're back to where our four viewports are. I could jump into top view by double clicking on top, and that makes that large. Double clicking to get back. So it's pretty easy to jump back and forth in those. OK, so when we start actually drawing in Rhino, the object that we're going to do, I have a tutorial written out for how we're going to do it. There's a link on our um, page here. Please follow the Rhino 5.2 Simple Shapes tutorial, which I already have open right here. And this will help walk us through what it is that we're creating. So we already have everything. We've already got new. We're going to start. And we're going to use either the top view or the perspective view. And we're going to start at our origin. And we're going to draw a five foot by five foot rectangle using the rectangle corner to corner tool. That's what it looks like right there. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. And then I'll probably do it many more times. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to use our rectangle corner to corner tool, which is this tool right here. Notice it's not the surface tool. So it doesn't have a blue surface on it. It's just the rectangle tool. I'll go ahead and click on that. Now our command line up here at the top is asking us or prompting us for the first corner of our rectangle. I'm going to go ahead and uh, type in here 0, 0, 0. It's not absolutely critical that we do that, but that's what I'm going to go ahead and type in. That starts us right at the center of our drawing, right there. We will talk at length about the coordinate system next class. So if that doesn't make any sense why I type 0, 0, 0, that's OK. We'll talk about it next class as we go forward. Now it says other corner or length. So I've got two different options here for how I want to create it. The other corner would be 5 feet, comma, 5 feet. Oops. Like that. And it's going to actually draw out my rectangle right there. And that's at 5 feet by 5 feet. Now in terms of interacting with this, this viewport, 
The scroll wheel is going to cause you to zoom in and zoom out. And if you right click and hold, it's going to allow you to orbit or rotate around your object. So right click to orbit, scroll wheel to move in and to move out. The holding down the middle mouse does not allow panning like it does sometimes in AutoCAD. Uh, we end up with a little shortcut menu there. So I don't recommend that. There is a customization where you can change that, but by default on these computers, it's not set that way. Uh, if you needed to pan for some reason, uh, you could type in pan, or you could use this hand tool here, which is in the standard tool tray, and that would allow you to pan around. You could also just zoom in and zoom out. What is it? Shift and shift and right drag, and that will pan too. So there's keyboard shortcuts and those kinds of things. I try to point them out as best I can. OK, so there's our little rectangle. We created that first. Next thing we're going to do is start to build out some framework to work with. Um, I want to fill in that surface. And I'm going to do that using the patch command. And you see here that I've pointed out its surface and then patch. That's in the menu structure. So I try to point these things out. So over here, if I went up to the surface menu and I went to patch, I could then patch in that surface. It's working because I already have it selected. If I didn't have anything selected and I want to surface and then patch, I'd look at my command line that says select curves. So I'd have to come back and select that curve right there. And then press Enter on the keyboard, and there it is. Now under my patch surface options, I'm going to go ahead and change the U and V spans to 2. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. It just creates a more complicated surface than you need for, for this particular piece. I'll go ahead and say OK. And when I do that, it will build a surface for me right there. So it's actually it's on top of the background. This just gives us some ground to work with. Uh, there is my first little surface. So one more time, I have nothing selected. I'm going to go up to Surface and then Patch. Alternatively, I could type in Patch into the command line and press Enter. Select Curves. There's my curve. I'll go ahead and hit Enter. My options here, uh, U and V are 2 and 2. And then I'll go ahead and say OK. And that creates my little uh, surface right there. OK, so I have that created. I'm going to go back and reference where we are. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to use a rectangular plane corner to corner to create a vertical plane at the back of this particular object. So now, in the, the tutorial it says vertical plane corner to corner. I'll show you that option, and I'll also show you one other way of doing this. So we're going to click on the surface tool. It's, it's actually the surface from three or four corner points. It's this one here. But I'm going to use that little triangle to bring out all of my options. So if I look in here, I have a rectangle corner to corner, rectangular plane corner to corner. And then two over, I have a vertical plane, both of which are, are valid, good uh, solutions. So I'll show you both options. So this rectangular plane corner to corner, if I cl click on that, I want the, the surface to go up, not out to the side. So if I were to go out to the side, you see I'm locked into the, the flat ground plane here. So before I create it, I'm going to look at my command line, and I'm going to click on where it says vertical. Or I could type the capital letter, which in this case would be V. So I'll go ahead and click on vertical. And now it's going to say start of edge. So I'd go there to there. Notice my snaps are on. So it snaps right to those corners. And then it says press the height. So I type in 5 feet. And that would give me the height. And then it says, choose rectangle. And what, that, what Rhino means by this is, do you want the one that's going up, or do you want the one that's going down? So you click on the side that you want to keep. So I want to be going up there, and that then creates that piece of it for me. The alternative, instead of uh, using the rectangle corner to corner, would be to choose this one, which is the vertical plane. It happens to be the same thing. I'll go from this edge to this edge, and I want to go up by 5 feet. I'll type in 5 apostrophe. There it is. 
and I want this rectangle, not that rectangle. So I'm going to click on this side, and then it's created that background piece for me. OK, I'm going to continue on here. And I'm going to repeat this to create the adjacent side. So same thing. I'll come over here to my tools. I'm going to choose the rectangular plane tool, or excuse me, the vertical plane tool. And I'm going to choose my edge from there to there. Now this time, I could type 5 feet, or I could actually snap to this object, which is already existing. So I could click right on that corner and know that it's 5 feet. Like that. And there's my object. So I'm going to keep going, but if you got lost, it's OK. I'm going to come back and do the whole shape again. So I'm going to keep moving forward, but if you get stuck on one of the following steps, it's OK. We'll come back. I'll do the whole thing one more time, maybe two more times. OK, so what I have now is I have a surface at the bottom right here. I have a surface at the back left, and I have a surface at the back right. Oh, sorry. All right. Yeah, you guys are like, great, already. <laughs> yeah, it's my first day too. Remember that. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue on, and we're going to use the polyline tool to create a diagonal line across the top of the cube. So what we want is we want our polyline tool, which is available right here. It's right below the uh, arrow. And we're going to go from this point straight across to that point on a diagonal. And because my snaps are on, it's easy to go from one point to another. The difference between a polyline and a line is that the polyline assumes you want to keep going. So with a polyline, I can keep clicking, 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 and it's going to keep drawing that line for me. In this scenario, I wanted to end. I drew from here to here, and then I want to end. To end the polyline command, I just go ahead and press the Enter key on the keyboard. And then I'm done. So I have just a single line that went across. I could have created that using the line tool, or I could use the polyline tool. So there it is. Next piece, we want to go ahead and we want to fill in that particular shape. I'm going to do that using the surface from three or four corner points command, which is this first tool right here. It's going to ask me the first corner of my surface. There's one. Second corner, there's two. Third corner, there's three. And the fourth corner, I don't have a fourth corner. So I'll just go ahead and press Enter. Notice it says from three or four corner points. So because I only have three, I press Enter. And now I have that little piece up here on top of my surface, or on top of my little cube. OK, so I'm more working my way through here. Next step, I'm going to go ahead, this is step 9, and I'm going to create what's called a derivative object. And so part of the thing that I do when I'm, I'm initially trying to teach you guys Rhino is I try to show you lots of things. And right now, if I wanted a, a line that went right along this edge, well, it'd be awfully easy to just come up here to the polyline and go ahead and draw that line in. And I'm done. Right? That's easy. That's an easy way of creating it. But imagine for a second that this was not just a straight line. It was the side of a piece of topography that went up and down and was all crazy. It would be really hard to trace over that line. So one of the things that uh, Rhino enables us to do is to create something called derivative geometry. I have a shape. I want another shape from that shape. So in this case, I have a surface. I want a line from that surface. So I'll create using a duplicate edge command. I'll go to the Curve menu, and I'll come down to Curve from Objects. Notice obje you know, Curve from Object. So I'm creating it from another object. And in this case, I'm going to duplicate an edge. If I wanted to type it into the command line, it's just dupe edge. And you'll see that on the handout, uh, actually, it's not on the handout because, did I put it on the back of this? Yes, I did. I put, the, I put the little tutorial on the back of it. That's good. Um, when I tell you something that you type into the command line, I use like a typewriter font in bold. 
So when I have these tutorials and stuff and you see a little typewriter font, same thing happens on the course website. So right here, if I use, oh, it's supposed to, right there, that should be in the little typewriter font. Of course, it's not on this one, but I try really hard to make sure that happens. Um, so you know that I'm typing something in. Oh, there it is. This one's in, in the typewriter font. So you can see that. Okay, so let me jump back to Rhino. There it is. And so I'm going to go up to that duplicate edge, and it's going to say select edges to duplicate. I want that edge right there. And when I press Enter, it will give me a curve from that particular edge. I'm going to go ahead and select that edge. And this brings up a good point. So in Rhino, I think this is actually one of the best features in Rhino. And why nobody else has copied it from them, I don't know. When you have objects that are on top of each other, instead of selecting the object on top, it brings up a little uh, selection menu that allows you to choose, well, wait, which object did you mean? Because there's multiples there. So it makes it really easy to pick. So I want just the curve here. I don't want that. And I don't want this one. So there it is, the curve in front. And now it's selected. So I have that curve selected. I'm going to hold down the Shift key on the keyboard. And I'm going to select this diagonal curve that I created right there. So I have the diagonal. I've held down Shift. And I have this piece selected. And I'm going to create a surface that goes between these two curves. And I'll do that by going up to the Surface menu. And I will choose the second one down, which is called Loft. So I have those two curves selected. I say Surface and then Loft. And the default options here are fine. So we'll go ahead and say OK. And you see that it's created a twisting surface for me. So it starts here, it twists, and it goes up to right there. So that's a lofted surface. We'll talk a lot more about what a lofted surface is and what you can do with it later on in the semester. Last piece I need is to fill in this triangle over here. So I'll go back to my um, tools over here. I'm going to choose a surface from three or four corner points. Notice I could also go up to the Surface menu and choose a surface. I never do it from here. It's surface corner points. There it is. First corner of surface. One, two, three. I'm ending right there. So I'll go ahead and press Enter. And that fills in that piece of the surface as well. You should see it like this, where you have a little bit of a gray scale. Sometimes, if you didn't start with my template, you may be in a different view where you're seeing it in wireframe mode, something like this, which can be problematic because it's harder to see what is a surface. So we're going to be in shaded mode for right now so that you can actually see it. The, the twisting surface, the loft? Yes, I will. Um, I'm going to leave this one here, and I'm going to draw the whole thing again. Okay, So I'll try to follow the same steps along. One of the, the other things that you'll learn about Rhino is I tend to give you as much step-by-step -step guidance as possible. But you could create this in many different ways. You can use different tools. You could build it differently. So as you go along in the semester, you'll learn your own workflow. You'll learn how you work and how you think. And that'll be a little bit different than how I do it. So I try to teach you commands that will help you get there. But it's not always uh, exactly the same. So I'm going to go ahead and start with that rectangle corner to corner. I'm going to start over here since I already have one. Uh, because uh, I don't know that coordinate anymore, I'm going to put the at sign in front of it. So I'll say at 5 feet, comma 5 feet, and go ahead and press Enter. And I'll explain what that at sign means next class. But that gives me the rectangle. Then I need to use the patch tool. So I'll go up to Surface, and then I'll choose Patch. There. The default options are just fine. I'll go ahead and say OK. And there it is. There's my little surface at the bottom. Next thing is the vertical planes. And come over here to my rectangular surface. I'm going to choose the vertical plane option, or I could choose the corner to corner. But in, if I do, I have to choose vertical and get to the same place. And I will draw from this corner to this corner. And my height is going to be 5 feet. So I'll type in 5 apostrophe to create that 5 feet. And I'll press Enter. And then it's going to ask me which rectangle, the top or the bottom. I want to be on the top side, so I'll go ahead and click it there. 
Come on in. So there is my first back. I need the second part. So I'll go back to my vertical plane. And I'll go from here to there. And this time I already have the five feet, so I can snap to that one instead of typing the five feet. And that'll create that side. So I have those two pieces. Next thing I need is a polyline that goes across from this corner to that corner. There it is. So I've drawn that polyline. I need one more line. I'm going to derive it from this shape at the bottom. So I'll go into my curve, curve from objects, duplicate edge, and I'll choose that edge, and I'll press Enter. This actually brings up a good um, small point that I'll, I'll share with you right now, and I'll, I'll encourage you um, to pay attention to these kinds of things later on in the semester. But when you execute a command in Rhino, like in this case, it created that curve for me. Notice that it automatically selects the curves that it just created. So it's still selected right now, which lets me jump right into selecting this line there, and then I can do the loft. So I didn't have to select the first one. So you can actually speed up your workflow by how you create objects uh, and how you use those objects. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pretend that I had nothing selected. I'll select this piece right there. There's that curve. I'll hold down Shift. I'll select that piece right there. I have both of these curves selected. And with both of those selected, I'm going to go up to my surface and then loft. And that then creates that twisting surface. Did you get it that time? OK. So both curves selected, surface, and then loft. Alternatively, I could type loft into the uh, uh, command line, and that would get me to the same place. I need to fill in those triangles. Looks like I did it slightly out of order to the last one. I apologize. That's what happens when you do it live sometimes. Uh, I need to fill in the top here, and I need to fill in this side. And I'll do that using my surface from three or four corner points. So there's my three or four corner points tool. I'll click one, two, and three. And I'll go ahead and press Enter. That creates the first one. Same thing, surface from three or four corner points. One, two, and three. I'll press Enter when I'm done. And that creates that one as well. Okay. So at this point, I've created my objects. My guess is that most of you have created your objects too. I'm going to pause the recording for just a second. I'm going to walk around and make sure everybody's gotten to the point where they have these. Then we'll do a little bit of rendering for fun. Why not? We'll throw that in on the first day too. Okay. So let me give me a second. I'm going to pause. I'm going to walk through. If you have gotten to this point and you've created one of these objects, that's all you have to do. That's great. Have it up on the screen so I can quickly see, and then we'll go back to making sure that it works. So hang tight for just a second. OK, so now that we've gotten to the point where we have an object or two, we're going to do just a little bit of V-Ray for the fun of it. Now, if V-Ray starts to get a little bit daunting, I'm not overly worried about this part. We will cover V-Ray in depth, I promise, uh, over the course of it. But sometimes people have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually select one of my objects. So I'm going to click out here in space where I'm not clicking on anything. And I'm going to drag a box around my objects to select those objects. When I have one of these selected, I'm going to open the V-Ray Asset Manager, which is something that's new in, in V-Ray, uh, or at least new to us. It's the first button here in the V-Ray toolbar. It's kind of like a, a V shape on a circle. When I click on that, it opens this V-Ray Asset Editor. I have some materials that have already loaded because of the template file, gold being one, red plastic being another. I have an orange porcelain. I have a shiny blue. I have a titanium. And I have a wax color, which is kind of a whitish color. Uh, any of these options are fine. You can work with any of those materials. If you want more materials, there's a little kind of, kind of arrow on the left side of the asset manager. And there, these are all the, the materials that are built into the new V-Ray. So if you wanted to do uh, car paint, for example, you can see that there's different car paint options. You can see the previews there. If you liked one of these, let's say I like the uh, cobalt blue car paint, 
I can click on this material and drag it over into my materials list and I'll, it will then add the cobalt blue car paint as one of the available materials for me to work with. I'm going to minimize that, that drawer on the left side here. I'm going to move this over just a little bit. And if I want the car paint to be applied to this object, I'm going to right click on the material and say apply to selection. And that's going to apply that material to that selection. Now unfortunately, nothing happened when I did it. And that's because the view that I'm looking in right now is only in shaded mode. If I go one more down to rendered mode, I'm not going to see anything. That's pleasant. Um, this is one of the things that happens sometimes. It has to do with where the lighting in the scene is. So I'm really not seeing anything. So we're going to actually have to render it out. So I'm going to go back to shaded mode so we can see my object. And then I'm going to go ahead and render this to see what happens. So this first option, or we, we did the asset manager. The next one over is like a teapot. I'm going to click on that teapot, and it's going to bring up a window for me. And it's going to render out my shape there. It's a little bit dark, unfortunately, which is not what I wanted. Let me spin around here for a second and do it from the back side and see if it's a little bit better here. Yeah, it's too dark. That's, that's unfortunate. Um, I apologize. Let's see if I can change anything. There we go. OK, so what I want you to do is um, in the VRA Asset Editor, and I apologize, this, these are the kinds of things that are going to happen this semester. And I apologize that this is just the way it's going to be because we're uh, uh, adjusting things. So we were currently on the materials, this first option here. If you go over to the gear icon in the Asset Editor, at the very bottom there's a, like a, an arrow circle looking thing. Click on that. It's going to restore everything to its default settings. Once you've clicked on that, then we can go back and re-render. So I'll click on the teapot again to render. And you'll see that when I re-render, there it is with the cobalt blue assigned to it. I can have different materials. So if I wanted, say, this object here to be a different material, I could go back to my materials and I could put on, oh, I don't know, let's put gold there. I'm going to right click on gold and say apply to selection. Now that gold is going to be applied to this object. We'll flip it around a little bit more, maybe about like that. And then I'll click on the teapot again. Maybe not. There it is. And it's building out my rendering here. And so we'll let it keep going for a little bit. But notice a few things. I want to point out a few things. The gold, for example, is shiny. If we look in the corner of the gold, we can see the reflection of this block. That's part of what makes V-Ray so good as a rendering engine, is it does basically what's called ray tracing. So when something strikes an object and it reflects, it goes off of another object, reflects back, it will do 8 to 16 of those bounces, which is very realistic when it comes to, to the actual renderings. So we'll let this have a little bit more time to finish up. For some reason, it's taking some time. It's probably trying to do it a little bit too high of quality for what we need it for. But such is life. We'll let it run. By the way, while I'm letting that finish up, did everybody sign this sheet? I know there's a couple people that came in late. You want to add, just put your name uh, on the back. Give me your student ID too.
because I need that to be able to do it. Okay, so I'll hand that to you. Okay, so now that it's done, it's time to go ahead and save that image. In this V-Ray frame buffer, the rendered image, there's a little disk icon. I want to click on that disk icon to save this. And today I'm going to save it just on the desktop. I don't have a flash drive here. Actually, I do, but we're assuming that you don't have a flash drive. I'll save it on the desktop, and I'll call this, uh, I don't know, render one. And I'll go ahead and click on save. So this is what I'm going to post. I'm not actually going to save or post the Rhino file, this Rhino file. I'm just going to post the rendering. So at this point, I'm going to jump over into the course website, and I'm going to talk through the course website to allow people to, to create a post. If you had trouble with your account and it hasn't, hasn't, uh, you haven't gotten your account yet or whatever, we'll resolve that after I'm done with the, the lecture for everybody, uh, and we'll make sure we, we work out those kinks. When you're done today and you've created the post, you're free to leave. It's one of the few days where you don't have to stay for the full time. So once you've, once you've gotten to that point, that's good. Come back next class. Make sure you bring your flash drive or hard drive for next class because you'll need to start saving stuff onto that drive. For today, it doesn't matter. You just need to do this as a one-off sort of thing. So when it comes to the website, I want to talk through this a little bit uh, as we get started here. The website is digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. The home page looks like this. This is where all of the content lives. If, for example, you needed to go look up the syllabus or something, you could go to the About tab. You could go to the 136 page. And there's the course syllabus, the calendar, et cetera. You can subscribe to the calendar feed, so it'll populate your calendar, your Google Calendar, your Outlook, or whatever, uh, should you want to do that. Next tab over are the lectures. This is where I try very hard to record all the lectures that I do. Sometimes things go wrong and the recordings crash or, or whatever. The hope is that they won't, and I'll post them here as well. You're always looking for the 136 section. Here's fall 2019. If I were to click on that, there's our first lecture for today, 201. If you click on that, it will give you ultimately a recording. Obviously, I haven't processed that yet and put it up there. But it will also give you all the previous lectures. Not that you would want to go watch the course introduction from you know the fall of 2016, but you could if you wanted to. Um, I, I have all previous stuff there because sometimes you need something sooner than when I post it. You can go back and watch last semesters. It's almost the same. When it comes to V-Ray this semester, it's always going to be different. So I can't do anything about it. You're the, you're the first class with the new V-Ray, so it's going to be what it's going to be. Uh, but those links will always be there. If there are specific downloads related to the, the course website, I'll put them there as well. If there are slides that I've shown, I'll put those there uh, and or any special links. So those will exist on the lecture page. Next one over is the tutorial section. You guys are concerned with Rhino and also with V-Ray. Those are the two sections that you'll be working with. Again, V-Ray is pretty outdated right now because we just upgraded. Uh, but under, under Rhino, all of this stuff works. And if, if you need to go in and, and work through something, those tutorials exist. You can click on them. There's usually um, you know, little screenshots and stuff to help you through. Some of them have videos to help you through as well. Next one over is the Exercises tab. This is where you find our exercises for the class. You already went there once today. Um, when you come up, there's our first exercise. Before next class, Exercise 202 will be posted. That's where the, the uh, content will be. Assignments, same thing, once assignments have been assigned. You guys have no assignments, so there's nothing actually listed except for last semester. Next one over is the Resources tab. This is where I store stuff that you may need down the road, like HDRIs and, and that sort of thing. We'll get to that when it's time to get to that. The good news is the new version of V-Ray has a bunch of materials built in, so you don't necessarily have to use all the uh, big material library that I had for the old version. So you can use a lot of the built-in materials as you get started. Next one over here is the Student Work section. This is where you see other people's work. So if we come down here, to the Digital Tools for Architects, and we go to Exercises, and we click on Exercise 201. That is today's exercise. And when we do that, you'll see all of the posts from uh, last semester. Well, maybe these, some of these are, <laughs> are new posts from this semester, but uh, this is where all of those previous exercises live. OK? So I have all of those in there so you can look at it. This will help you with commenting a little bit later on. I will walk you through commenting. You don't have to do anything about that just yet. 
The last one over here is the login. This is where you'd go to log in. You'll type in your username or your email address and your password. If you don't currently have um, one of these accounts, I will set one up for you. Uh, the reason that I set them up for you is so that you don't have to pay for anything. It's an indefinite account. You just get it. Don't worry about it from then on. Uh, so I will do that for you. I need on the, uh, the sheet that I'm passing around, I need your name and your email so that I can put it in for those two things for anybody that didn't have it. If you already have an account, you don't have to worry about it. So uh, hand it across there. Perfect. And I will make sure that I create those for you. Okay. Um, so that's how you would log in. If you don't know what your password is, you can do the lost your password and it'll email you a temporary password that you can then reset later on. So now that I'm gone ahead and I've logged in, I'm going to go ahead and I'll get back to the page itself. There it is. There'll be a black bar that appears at the top of the page. That means you're logged in. When it's time to create a post, I'm going to go up to the new button right here and I'm going to choose post from the drop down list. So new post. This brings up the add a new post. Here under the title, I'll probably say exercise 201. And maybe I'll add my name. There we go. Notice up here at the very top, it says this entry has no featured image. You're required to have an image before you post. No surprise, you need to have an image because that's how you're going to turn stuff in. So I make that a, a mandatory thing. So I need to add that. I'm going to add that by scrolling all the way to the very bottom of the page. Bottom right corner is a featured image box. I'm going to go ahead and click on that set featured image button. And I will upload. So I'll click on upload files. And I'm going to select that rendering that I just saved. There it is. We'll go ahead and say open. And there it is. I'll go ahead and click on the set featured image. And now it shows up as my featured image. I'll scroll back up to the top here. The last thing I need to do is categorize this post. So we're in Digital Tools for Architects. This is 136. This is Exercise 201. Don't make it Assignment 201. It's not Assignment 201. It's Exercise 201. So I'm going to check the box for Exercise 201 there. I'll scroll back up a little bit more. That's all I need to do. And I'll go ahead and click on Publish. I don't actually have to write anything. This class is very little writing. So you very rarely have to write anything about what you did. Uh, if you wanted to write something, you could write it in this. It's kind of like Word, where you just type something in that you want. I'll go ahead and click on Publish. And that's essentially like turning in your post or turning in your work. I can click on, after it's published, I can click on this View Post to say, oh yeah, it did work. There's my image. Furthermore, if you go to the student work section and you go to exercise 201, it should have shown up. There it is. Sorry, it was a couple back. Um, there's the one that I posted. So as you guys start to post, it will fill in uh, and it'll all show up here. Okay? So that's creating a post. If you want to change your password for some reason, that is on the back side of the website, which is under Dashboard here. You can come down to your profile. If you scroll down here, you can fill in your name and how you want to be shown online, etc. And if you come all the way down here, you can generate a new password, which gives you a random string. But then you can type in you know, some other password like my dog, you know, 123, or, or whatever. Okay. Uh, if it's a really weak password, like my dog 123, you have to confirm that, yes, I do want to use a weak password. It's a security thing. But you can do that should you want to. I'm not actually going to change my password, but if you wanted to, that's how you would change it. And then you can click on your update profile and it's set. Okay? So um, I will turn you guys loose to finish up. I'll come around and I'll make sure that I help everybody. I'm going to spend just a second and get those of you that don't have an account yet set up so that you can do the post part of it. Uh, and then I'll keep walking through until everybody's done. Once you're done and you've created the post, you're safe to leave for today. Come back next class. Remember to bring your flash drive or your hard drive because we'll need that for next class. Um, and I think that's it. Are there any questions before I turn you loose? No? OK. Sounds good.